This week on The Communicators, a discussion on how the U.S. prepares for cybersecurity attacks. Our guest is Representative Dan Lundgren, ranking member of the Homeland Security Subcommittee on Emerging Threats, Cybersecurity, Science and Technology. Congressman Dan Lundgren is a ranking member on the Homeland Security Subcommittee on Emerging Threats and Cybersecurity. What are your responsibilities? Well, I hope our responsibilities are to try and uh, lend a sense of urgency to the Congress and to the executive branch as well as to the public uh, with the continuing threats, emerging threats that we have from a Homeland Security standpoint. Uh, we do have in our title, as you mentioned, science and technology, meaning that we hope to advance the application of science and technology to methods which will make us more safe, if you will, and also cybersecurity which among the uh, panoply of uh, subject areas dealing with homeland security is probably a lagging indicator. And I don't say that as a, um, as a criticism, I say that as an observation. And it's partly because of the nature of what we're talking about. Um, we were able after 9-11 to really firm up our aviation security. Uh, I was a co-author, well I was the main author along with um, Jane Harmon of the Safe Ports Act to, to firm up the security at our ports. I've been working on transportation security. Uh, I helped write the uh, security uh, modalities for uh, chemical facilities. But in those categories, you see that the, it's something you can see, touch, feel, sense. Um, it is easier to build the uh, response because the threat is more evident. In the area of cybersecurity, that's inside of things. You don't see it. But because it has become so ubiquitous, that is, it, it is everywhere, I think it is even more important uh, than it's ever been before. It, it applies to many of the physical structures and infrastructure we have, and yet in a sense it's hidden, so it's tough to get people to understand the uh, uniqueness of, of, of the importance and the threat and the immediacy of it as well. Are you finding that members of Congress are not interested in cybersecurity? No, I think they're interested in cybersecurity from time to time. But, I mean, if you ask me, are members of Congress or the public concerned about the threat we have from Al-Qaeda uh, or its uh, affiliates, um, I would say that's intermittent. I mean, look, we got very concerned right after the Christmas uh, bombing effort uh, event. Uh, now we're very concerned about what's happened in New York. But what's happened in the interim? We go through about three, three weeks or four weeks of real concern, then we forget about it. And you can look at, on the agenda of Congress, you can look at the budgets, you can look at the, the polls that show what's most on the minds of Americans in terms of elections coming up. I mean, all those indicators of whether or not we're concerned disappoint me because we have a continuing threat to which we must respond, and vigilance is the watchword. In New York City, for instance, it is two, one or two members of the public who saw something that didn't seem right and reported it. Thank God they did. Also, thank God we had somewhat incompetent terrorists, it appears. But my, my point is, those two individuals, members of the public, had a sense of that urgency. So I'm talking about it across the board, but when you look at cybersecurity, it's the lagging indicator because these other things are, are more evident, and you can get people really... Um, focused on that, it's more difficult to get them focused on cybersecurity. Well, Congressman Lundgren, in your view, how dire are the threats from cybersecurity issues? Well, you've got to realize that there's a whole range there, uh, all the way from hackers, mischievous hackers, to ones that want to do it for some devilish reason, uh, to uh, the criminal enterprises. I mean, there's some suggestion that uh, the overall organized criminal enterprise worldwide gets more out of cyber security attacks than it does from any other type of crime. Uh, you have the transnational terrorist organizations, and then you have the nation states. I mean, all of them are in the play right now, and they are uh, more aggressive than they ever have been before, and there's more of them, and there's more opportunities for them, in part because the grand world of, of uh, cyber, the digital world, um, is pervasive in our lives and makes much of our uh, standard of living and, and uh, the um, enjoyment of things that we find are more readily available. It, it, but, but it's interconnected. So the very strength of the cyber world is also the vulnerability. 
in your view, what's the best way to get it out of the intermittent interest level? Uh, we have to have an educational campaign of a type that actually attracts the attention of the American people. I mean, I have said, and it may sound hackneyed, but we need uh, a cyber security Smokey the Bear. Um, when we had the, the concerns about forest fires uh, 40, 50, 60 years ago, we had the incident of that one bear that was found that was uh, uh, a survivor from the burn, became known as Smokey the Bear, became the symbol, became part of the uh, um, continuing ongoing program of concern about that. Everybody knows that. Uh, we need to have something, I don't know what that is yet, but we need to have something like that that, that attracts people's attention so they begin to understand that we are subject to attack from all those different uh, sources, but there are things we can do. I mean, I was just out at Microsoft, talked with the top person there from security. His statement was 99% of the attacks can be avoided by people just doing simple things that it's already available to them. Such as? Such as making sure they keep updated with uh, the new um, security responses that, uh, all those companies are out there producing. So when we, when Microsoft says we've got an update for you, get their update. So as long as it's, as long as you can identify that that's that's the one. And, and what I mean by that is, I mean I was tired one night at home uh, going through mine, and something came on said you know warning, uh, your your computer's under attack, you need this update. I happen to have Norton. Uh, I thought it was. I wasn't sharp enough to to look at that moment to realize, and so. Yes, I, I indicated, well, then my whole thing exploded, in, in essence. And then I had to go back to my, I, I realized what had happened. I immediately went to uh, my Norton uh, uh, system, and it had to go through an entire review of every single file I had and found a whole bunch of things that uh, were uh, detrimental to my system. Um, so even those of us who have a little bit of sense of, of that make mistakes as well. But the point is, you should stay updated with something that you have confidence in. That's probably the, the, the simplest um, advice I could give. And the way these attacks are coming, they, they manage to figure out what the vulnerabilities are fairly soon. And so they'll attack them. And so if you're weeks past when they've done that sort of thing, uh, you're vulnerable. But let's take it to a federal level and yes, to a sure. security level. Absolutely. And what, what is the threat to the U.S. government, cybersecurity threat, to the U.S. government, to our, to our safety, and what are the sure. best solutions? It's multifaceted, that is the threat. It goes all the way from invading the private sector, um, let's say upsetting the financial markets. I mean, we saw recently what can happen with good information or bad information uh, and then reaction uh, by the markets themselves. What if that information is invaded in such a way that it is inaccurate but people do not realize it at the time? I mean, so, so there's the private sector. There is the area of, um, of infrastructure, power grids, uh, water systems. Those are now very much part of the digital world in terms of the command systems that are involved there. I think we're doing much better now than we were just a few years ago on that, but you have to realize a lot of those command and control systems were developed over the years and they are a, um, an accumulation of a number of different programs and at the time they were created we weren't concerned about cyber attacks. So we had to go back and patch that and the new systems that have come on build in the security there. With respect to defense, a DOD, you know, innumerable attacks per day, uh, Congress, all that. So um, they could upset the workings of government by interfering with the information system if they uh, actually were able to take control of command and control systems with respect to our infrastructure. You can imagine what what could happen. So it, it again, it's multifaceted, and. We are doing a better job. The Defense Department probably leads the government in both the ferreting out what the uh, threats are and responding to them. The executive branch is doing a better job. I have to give both President Bush and President Obama credit on beginning to, to have a focus there. The Congress is also coming along on this. Um, but here, here's the real challenge. The real challenge is how do we in Congress in terms of putting through laws, make sure that we're not trying to establish what the particular means are to protect against a particular threat. 
And what I mean by that is it happened so fast you couldn't pass legislation that would anticipate everything. It seems to me our obligation, our um, challenge is to come up with a set of standards by which we suggest and in some cases require that the business community, the private uh, sector involve themselves in those protections work with government in coming up with those ideas. But most of the ideas are going to come from the, the private sector. And so uh, when I say that, uh, I'm suggesting what are the incentives we can build in the system to make this part of the bottom line in the private sector? Uh, it could be in the area of tax incentives. It could be to say that um, if you put through certain cybersecurity uh, programs, that in the case that there is a breach, if your programs meet the standards that have been set by the government, you may have uh, immunity against civil liability. Well, that would be a tremendous uh, incentive for someone to go ahead and do that. It could be with uh, tax incentives. Um, the challenge is this in some cases. If, in fact, the threat is small, that is, we don't have good evidence that anybody is particularly going after your business or your business sector, but the potential um, consequence is great. If they did go after your sector, how do you get someone who is making decisions within a business, knowing that they owe a, a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders, make that part of the bottom line? In some cases, government has got to guide that. But if we go too far that we say, here's exactly what you have to do, we may be telling them to uh, develop a an approach to technology which will uh, uh, be um, leapfrogged within a year or so. So I think that's the challenge, that Congress not say, we know best and we're going to demand you do that, but find ways to get the cooperation and to get performance out of both the private sector and the public sector. Well, Richard Clark, former special yes. advisor to President Bush on terrorism, uh, has a new book out and it's called Cyber uh, cyber war, what it is and how to fight it. Here's just a little bit of what he had to say. We're really good on the offense. Cyber Command and other units in the U.S. military and intelligence community have been doing this stuff for years. They invented it. They're really good at it. And you have to assume that anything anybody else is doing, probably the United States government is doing too, only better. So when you read about all those Chinese attacks, hacking into Google and everything else in America, yeah, you know, somebody's probably doing it to China. But we have no plan, no system, no strategy to defend this country against cyber attack. Congressman. I would say that we do not have a fully developed, robust defense against cyber attack across all of the media that I mentioned before. Are we doing better? Yes, we are. Are we there yet? No. Do I think we're close yet? No. Uh, but um, that's why I'm trying to raise the, the concern. Uh, it, takes a certain, uh, it takes a tremendous amount of commitment to do this. And the first obligation is understanding the, uh, first obligation of those of us in government is, is not only us understanding, but getting the public to understand the threat that's out there so that we can have the support for doing the things that we need to do. Um, much of the discussion that takes place in the cyber world today is uh, protection of privacy, right of privacy, etc. And that is a part of it. But uh, we also have to examine those steps we must take in just uh, the, the sense of peer security. How do you make sure that the system is not invaded in such a way that it's taken over by somebody else? Not just for um, nefarious criminal activity, but for true um, attacks on our national security. I mean, look what happened when the uh, Russians dealt with Georgia. I'm talking about the country of Georgia, not our state of Georgia. Uh, they had a military action, but they also had a cyber attack. Remember that. If you were to envision the most effective way to do damage to a country, United States or any other country, in my, my judgment, it would be a coordinated attack. It would be a military attack plus a cyber attack. You can disable the physical 
properties of your defense establishment, of your, your financial institutions, of your uh, electrical grid, of your um, water system by capturing, taking over, interfering with, in some way invading the cyber world that helps control those things, in addition to having a military attack to actually go after and destroy uh, physical assets. Well, what is the coordination level? How would you describe it when it comes to, to your committee, uh, to working with Howard Schmidt, the White House cybersecurities are, uh, getting advice from defense, sure. working with DHS, et cetera? I'm very, I'm very pleased that the president did bring in a cybersecurity czar. There was a long lag time there. I was disappointed in that, but I think he's got a good man there. The question is, uh, what vantage point of uh, authority or um, leadership will he have across the executive branch? I think that's still to be determined. I think I know what he wants to do. I think I know what the the paperwork suggests is going to happen. But you know, you're dealing with cultures of so many different um, uh, elements of the executive branch. Uh, secondly, I think there is a spirit of cooperation uh, among the different committees in the Congress and the administration, uh, and the elements of of it, including Defense Department, etc. I think one of the things that's lacking is we in Congress have still not responded to one of the major complaints of the 9-11 Commission, that is Congress has not organized itself uh, in a slimmed down and uh, more discreet uh, manner such that we can work on a better basis with the executive branch. I mean, the number of committees they have to respond to across the board, uh, committees and subcommittees with respect to questions of homeland security is nuts. Uh, the whole reason we established a uh, Homeland Security Committee in the House was presumably to take care of that problem. Yet a lot of the other committees didn't want to let go of their jurisdiction. And, and that interfered. Instead of having proper, vigorous, robust, uh, earnest oversight, which is what we need to have, we have that multiplied several different ways, which actually interferes with the effectiveness of it. And what I mean by that is if you've got members of the executive branch who have key roles in cybersecurity and the other areas of security, and you have them coming up and, and testifying multiple times about the same subject or, or subjects that are just slightly different, you're interfering, frankly, with their, their uh, ability to perform, it seems to me. And um, it's, it's a lack of Congress being able to give up the pride of authorship, ownership, or territorial uh, power uh, in the legislative process. We, and it happened under Republicans, it's happened under Democrats. And if there's one thing that could make it work more effectively in cybersecurity than the other, it would be for Congress to finally say, you know, we have a Department of Homeland Security. It is a, it is a, uh, a reality. Uh, it brought together, um, in some cases, discordant uh, uh, elements of the executive branch, for better or worse. We did that uh, in the House of Representatives. Let's make it work. Um, so. There is uh, progress, but there's a need to have a lot more progress. Well, let's look at it from the House and Senate point of view. Yes. Um, it, is there cooperation there? There's quite a few bills that have been introduced, almost omnibus yes. cybersecurity acts. Yes. Um, what do you think of that approach? Is it possible, it, especially with the changing technology, as fast as technology changes these days? I, I think... Um, uh, there are a couple of bills under discussion on the Senate side, um, and I see some good, good aspects of them. Uh, I think we're going to follow up on, on our House side, uh, not in terms of a competitive spirit, but rather a spirit of cooperation, seeing where we can work together as, as quickly as possible on that. Um, one of the areas uh, where we passed legislation out of our subcommittee and our full committee uh, in, the, uh, in the House was on... Uh, giving a, a little bit of reorganization to the science and tech uh, a pod of, of uh, Homeland Security. And one of the things we put in there was to try and see if we give a greater emphasis to moving along new science and technology application to the area of the world of cybersecurity. Um, so I think, I think we're, we're, we're moving. When we did that, we came up with our bill. We then asked for review by the executive branch. We didn't accept everything they said, but we brought a lot of their um, suggestions to bear on that. I think you're going to find the same thing with the precise 
language dealing with cybersecurity as a distinct uh, subject, both on the Senate side and the House side. Uh, so there is, there is a spirit of cooperation I, I see developing because we all understand that we've got a long way to go on this. I mean, it's not that we're pointing fingers. I don't think anybody is House side, Senate side, executive branch, legislative branch. It is a recognition of the fact that we have a lot of work to do, and let's get going on that. But I, I will say, uh, fundamental to all we need to do is an educational campaign of some sort that, uh, that not only uh, allows the American people, but draws the American people into this discussion. They need to be a part of it because the cyber world is a part of everything they do today. Um, uh, we need to show them that there are reasonable steps that they can take to protect themselves, but they have to understand the vulnerabilities that are out there, and we need to grow support in the public sector to do those things that will take money and, uh, and manpower within the, um, within the federal government to deal with these problems. Congressman Lundgren, you also serve on the Judiciary Committee, yes, spent eight years as Attorney General for the state of California. What about penalties for cybersecurity criminals? Has that been looked at at all, or is it something you're interested in? We're just beginning to see um, some lawsuits uh, or, or some prosecutions going on in that world. I mean, we just had the one, I don't think the uh, sentence has, has uh, come uh, in on the case of the uh, person who hacked into uh, Sarah Palin's uh, um, cyber world, if you will. Uh, interesting prosecution that, that went down down there. Uh, some people were saying, wait a second, it's just some guy having fun and so forth. I mean, we have to get over that idea about it's just some people having some fun doing it. They are um, going after vulnerabilities. Now, in the area of organized crime, those are very difficult cases to put together and to prosecute. And I think the, the uh, penalties, I think we have some strong penalties on that, but we're going to have to see the outcomes of some cases as they come down. But you have to realize the very um, strength of the uh, cyber world, the Internet, uh, the worldwide Internet, is also a tremendous vulnerability. The anonymity that is available through that system, which actually attracts a lot of people to the system for good things, can be used by the rogues of the world, and there's no doubt about that. Uh, you have to track where the, um, the operatives are with respect to a criminal enterprise. And they can disguise themselves well now. They could be in, in Uganda. They could be in China. But uh, the indication from us is that the server is somewhere in the United States or in Canada. I mean, these are um, smart people utilizing uh, a great system, the accessibility of which is the great attraction, but again, it's the great vulnerability. What about state sponsors of cybersecurity threats? It is real. It is real. I mean, we hear about China all the time. I mean, a lot of that stuff is, uh, is classified, but a lot of it obviously has gotten out. I don't think there's any uh, question that uh, they're much involved in it. Um, any country that seeks to have some sort of uh, military capacity is involved in that necessarily. I don't think there's any doubt about that. You heard what uh, Mr. Clark said about uh, the capabilities of the United States. But there's, there's, a, there's a question in all of this about um, do you take a defensive posture or do you take an offensive posture? And do you take an offensive posture to negate an attack? And then some people say, well, you're escalating it because you're taking an offensive posture against that system as they're coming in against you. I mean, there's a lot of question out there as to how you respond in the appropriate way. First and foremost, it seems to me, is we have to have the capacity to be able to defend ourselves and to have options as to how that defense takes place. Uh, and that takes money, and that takes manpower, and it takes a commitment from the Congress to support a manpower and money. A couple more questions, yes. and then we'll let you go. Um, there, the California delegation to Congress is working on, and I want to get the name of it right, um, is a U.S. Cyber Challenge. What is the U.S. Cyber Challenge that you are supporting? Well, let me, let me uh, put it in a more um, a fuller context. I am attempting to support a number of different initiatives which will allow, and I don't want to make it California specific so that I don't get the support of others. Um, I, I'm trying to do across the board a um, support of, of the cyber world in the sense that the United States 
was the developer of it. The United States has been the one on the cutting edge. We cannot afford to lose that. And I'm a little fearful in some cases in terms of tax policy particularly where that's, that's harmful to us. All the way from that to, uh, and my focus again is on, is on security more than anything else. Um, so I've been part of different things, but uh, in my position uh, as the ranking member, I don't want it to appear that I'm trying to do it just for California as opposed to the rest of the country. I, I think, um, look, California suffers from the standpoint that we're the biggest state in the union with the largest number of members of Congress. And um, a lot of other states say, okay, they're the big guy. They're beating up on us. We've got to uh, have allies against them. Uh, my position is, in everything I'm doing, it's for the support of this country on cybersecurity. Yes, we are very lucky that in California, Silicon Valley took place. Not l luck and, and hard work. That um, the real progress in terms of risk takers allowing us to um, go forward on uh, advances uh, in the digital world uh, has been led at Californ by California. I'll tell you, I'm concerned about some of California's tax policies and regulatory policies making it more difficult for those companies to operate in that space uh, in, in, in California. So I'm trying to be a little um, inclusive on that, I guess is what I'd say. Well, as you mentioned, California does have a lot of the high-tech companies yes, that work indeed. on these issues. And I know Intel is in and around, uh, in a big way, around your district. Largest, around... largest private employer in my district. Yes. Right. Have, when you meet with them and talk about cybersecurity, what, what can you share with us? Uh, I meet with them or meet with Microsoft or meet with, with any of them or, or meet with the Alliance. Um, they share my concern about a lack of understanding or urgency in this country. Uh, as I say, uh, one of the top uh, security people in the private sector told me just this last week that if we just applied already existing programs, we could protect against 99% of what's out there. Now that 1% is still big, but 99% of the attacks that are out there we could, we could forestall. I didn't know that you could speak with confidence uh, to that. In fact, I asked him several times, are you sure about that? He said, yes. So what does that mean to me? That means that education is first and foremost. If that is true, or even close to true, then getting people to understand that and to apply those things which will allow them to protect against these attacks is number one. We can do more with that than any single thing. And final question, are we spending enough, in your view, on uh, cybersecurity? In the area of cybersecurity, we, uh, we could probably spend more effectively. Uh, a lot of people would say that in a lot of different areas, but there, I can particularly say that here because we are in some ways playing catch up relative to other areas of protection against uh, attacks on our homeland. Uh, again, it's the lagging indicator, not because uh, anybody has not wanted to do something on it, but just the nature of the beast has caused it to be that. So in some ways, you've got to admit that so we can work at it and we can uh, get that emphasis and that um, urgency involved. We have been talking with Representative Dan Lundgren, a Republican of California and ranking member on the Homeland Security Subcommittee on Emerging Threats and Cybersecurity. Thank you, Congressman, All for right. being on the co communicators. Thank you. My pleasure.